By coincidence, I first met with Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson on the very day Occupy Wall Street had sprung up in lower Manhattan. And I wondered, as so many others did, were we seeing the advance guard of a movement by organized people to challenge the power of organized money? Well, it's still too soon to know. But in the weeks that followed, every time we went down to the encampment, there was no mistaking the message. I don't have thousands of dollars to go buy myself a lobbyist to lobby for my views, but corporations do. Linnea Palmer Patton is 23 and an Occupy Wall Street volunteer. This is supposed to be a government for the people, you know, run by the people. And if our voices don't matter because we're not wealthy, that's really unacceptable and it's dangerous. My name is Hero Vincent. I'm 21 years old. I've been here since day one. My parents were foreclosed on. My father's been out of play in a couple years. My mother was the only one taking care of the family for a while. I've been working since I was 14 years old, you know, trying to put food on our table, trying to help out with the bills. And um, so all these circumstances, my sister's in college and she, we can barely afford it, you know? And so it brought us here. Like the struggle brought us to this, this occupation. This day, this, this moment. It ain't no harm to occupy if you're set on freedom. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amin Hussein is a former corporate lawyer. He's now an artist who has become one of the many organizers of Occupy Wall Street. This connection between government and state regulating money and the flow of money at the expense of 99% of the population is untenable and it's no longer being accepted. And there's been a shift in the way people think of themselves in this political process. That there has been a level of empowerment. But this movement is about transforming society. All of us who are sleeping at home, we're writing letters, we're thinking about you. Thank and you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate we're changing it. changing our Let bank accounts. My family's home was almost foreclosed in Hackensack, New Jersey. Um, first by Providian Bank, then by uh, Bank of America, then Chase. The names changed. Um, and uh, we were almost homeless. Yesenia Berrigan is working for her doctorate in Latin American history at Columbia University. We were um, able to gather enough resources, enough money within our family um, to save the house. So we like to say that we were the lucky ones. And I'm basically here because I don't want to live in a world where there are lucky ones and unlucky ones. My name is Daniel Lynch. I live in Manhattan. And in my spare time, I try to trade stocks. I might even be center right. And I still support this, and I want people to know that, yeah, right, 99%, exactly, right? I've been worried for a long time about problems with wealth inequality in the country, income inequality, and I, I just wanted to throw my support a little. I, I don't march, I don't carry a sign, but I come down at night, I talk to some people. I believe in capitalism, I believe in capital markets, but unchecked like this, especially the way we have estate taxes, income taxes, uh, it, 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 it subverts capitalism, it becomes feudalism. Owners of capital are winning so much more than laborers, right? Capital is, uh, you know, it has no roots, right? And uh, to, to, to just deny that that's happening and not have a little bit of an activist tax policy about it, I think it's naive, it's destructive, and it's, it's just, it's absurd. Um, my name is Nalini Stamp. Um, I'm 24 years old. Nalini Stamp is a community organizer. She joined Occupy Wall Street on its first day. I've been fed up with having to worry about living paycheck to paycheck. Um, because of corporate greed and because we don't have a very high minimum wage in New York. We really just wanted to take a major leap in fighting back. I think that we need to, first of all, have public financing of elections. Um, that is a huge deal. One of the reasons is, you know, why corporations is because there are unlimited amount of donations that they can give to political campaigns. And it's about time we all stand up and, and take this back. I found my voice. I've been very apathetic, very cynical of the system that do I matter? Do I matter to politicians? Do I matter to government when policies are being made? Tyler Kumbelik volunteered with Occupy's media outreach team. Well, personally, I want to see money out of government. Uh, I'm a very big proponent of campaign finance reform, of limiting the role of lobbyists and limiting the role of corporate personhood. 
because I feel right now who has the largest war chest is the determiner of who's going to be elected for a specific office or what kind of uh, laws are going to be passed by Congress. And that corporatist type of government is not what the United States is supposed to be. You got a better chance of being an organ donor than seeing any retirement money. I, mean, I think this is a perfect kind of forum for us to all come and talk about back and forth. Yeah, I, I've seen many souls change in the last three days. Really? Yeah, on all sides, including the other side of the barricade. See, I went through the Woodstock generation, and I thought it was just back to business as usual. It just sort of it was a big party. That's what I see this as, a party with no cover. I'm a defender of, of money, freedom, individual freedom, rich people, because I'm tr still, even though I got great, I'm still trying to be one. Because the more money I have, the more good I can do. And it'll be my decision as to how I allocate that good, how I allocate that capital. But when I look around at all these buildings, hospitals, colleges, I don't see many poor people's names. They're all rich people. <laughs> Reverend Ike, a black minister, used to preach up here in New York. He used to say, if you curse the rich, you'll never be one. I mean, look at the people out here. You think they're out here just hanging out? I mean, that blows my mind that you came out here and you said, well, people out here, you know, they, they, they have something against wealthy people. You know, wealthy people should be allowed to be wealthy people because while we're wealthy people, we'll throw money out and sprinkle it upon and, and make people's lives better. It's not happening. Wealthy companies are not making the common person's lives better. They're taking their money, they're moving it abroad, they're doing different things. Yeah, what's that got to do with it? Nice anything? camera. You got clothes. You're I, I just told you that I that I I'm not one of the ones. I can't be so pessimistic about things. I'm not. I'm being You're realistic. I live in a very nice house. My family's blessed, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm you know that I don't have anything. But I do also recognize that. A lot of the situations we're in now is because of greed. It's because it's not what he said. Well, you, you just let people take their money and, and and they'll do good things with it. Not all people do good things with their money. The one percent, the one percent have dominant, have dominant political power, political power over both parties, over both parties. Organizers invited Bill Black to lead a teach-in at the People's Microphone. Okay. How many think they stole from all of us? A senior federal regulator in the 1980s, Black cracked down on banks during the savings and loan crisis. He now teaches economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. What we have is recurrent, intensifying financial crises driven by elite fraud, and now it's done with almost absolute impunity. So the whole idea of noblesse oblige and such and that the rich were supposed to have special responsibilities, that's all gone, right? It's, they have a God-given right to the lowest conceivable taxes when you put anti-regulators in charge of the agencies who believe that regulation is bad and completely unnecessary. And they destroy it, create a self-fulfilling prophecy that produces massive fraud at the most elite levels, but worse, it all feeds into politics. So once you get a group that completely dominates the economy, they're going to completely dominate politics as well. There is no excuse. There is no excuse. For not prosecuting. For not prosecuting. It is an obscenity. It is an obscenity. It's surrender. It's to crony capitalism. To crony capitalism. What's distressed me, um, and I think is one of the major reasons we get recurrent intensifying crises, is we seem to have lost our capacity for outrage. And it's only people getting outraged that produces really positive social change. Two years. He's got a family. I think it's just terrible that they don't care. 
They're making millions of dollars. I mean, Mitch McConnell has uh, is a multimillionaire. John Boehner is a multimillionaire. They don't care about the people. They really don't. And their own districts have many people who are unemployed, who are having foreclosures. And it's time that they stop playing this game. And uh, really said, you know, I think maybe we'll pass something that will help build our infrastructure or get people back to work. So this is a start. I hope it, it makes a dent. The fact that it's not just here, but it's all over the country now, means that somebody's waking up. Waking up is right. Waking up to the reality that inequality matters. It matters because what we're talking about is what it takes to live a decent life. If you get sick without health coverage, inequality matters. If you're the only breadwinner and out of work, inequality matters. If your local public library closes down and you can't afford to buy books on your own, inequality matters. If budget cuts mean your child has to pay to play on the school basketball team or sing in the chorus or march in the band, inequality matters. If you lose your job as you're about to retire, inequality matters. And if the financial system collapses and knocks the props from beneath your pension, inequality matters. I grew up in a working class family. We were among the poorest in town, but I was rich in public goods. I went to a good public school, played sandlot ball in a good public park, had access to a good public library, drove down a good public highway to a good public college, all made possible by people I never met. There was an unwritten bargain among the generations. We didn't all get the same deal, but we did get civilization. That bargain's being shredded. The occupiers of Wall Street understand this. You could tell from their slogans. A fellow young enough to be my grandson wore a t-shirt emblazoned with the words, the system's not broken, it's fixed. That's right, rigged. And that's why so many are so angry. Not at wealth itself, but at the crony capitalists who resort to tricks, loopholes, and hard, cold cash for politicians to make sure insiders prosper and then pull up the ladder behind them. Yes, Americans are waking up to how they're being made to pay for Wall Street's malfeasance and Washington's complicity, paying with stagnant wages and lost jobs, with slashing cuts to their benefits and to their social services. And waking up to the grotesque Supreme Court decision defining a corporation as a person, although it doesn't eat, breathe, make love or sing, or take care of children and aging parents. Waking up to how campaign contributions corrupt our elections, to the fact that if speech is money, no money means no speech. So the collective cry has gone up loud and clear, enough's enough. We won't, as I said, know for a while if this is just a momentary cry of pain or whether it's a movement that, like the abolitionists and suffragettes, the populists and workers of another era, or the civil rights movement of our time, gathers force until the powers that be can no longer sustain the inequality, the injustice, and yes, the immorality of winner-take-all politics. Our coverage of politically engineered inequality continues in our next two broadcasts. First, David Stockman, a one-time enforcer of the Reagan revolution. There was clearly reckless speculative behavior going on for years on Wall Street. It was encouraged by the Federal Reserve, which is dominated by Wall Street. And John Reed, a banker's banker who was there when Washington loaded the dice and Wall Street rolled them. It wasn't that there was one or two institutions that, you know, got carried away and did stupid things. It was we all did. And then the whole system came down. And at our new website, BillMoyers.com, I interviewed two Occupy Wall Street organizers who give us insight into the movement and what it hopes to accomplish. We'll also link you to our interview with the editors of Mother Jones Magazine and their coverage of the dark money that has cast a deep shadow across this election year. That's at BillMoyers.com. See you there and see you here next time.